Hi, good morning, and welcome to our live webinar on behavior change moving out of the perma crisis. My name is Lenneke Schils. I'm Global Insights Director at GFK, and I'll be your host for the next uh, hour or so. I won't be alone. Uh, I invited one of my very most favorite colleagues, Carmen Cuadra Gomez. She is our marketing lead for uh, Consumer Panel. And frankly, because we are now, well, three years into this permanent state of crisis and more than a year into the cost of living situation, um, shoppers are really changing a lot, not only what they're saying, doing, um, wanting and wishing and needing, but also, frankly, it has a really large impact on how they are feeling as human beings. Um, so I uh, reckon it was a really good uh, idea to invite Carmen to also uh, ask her and invite her to shed her professional view on how uh, all of that constellation is really uh, impacting how to, from a marketing perspective, how to engage uh, with, with consumers in the end in this um, yeah, quite difficult context, really. So I can tell you upfront also that it uh, won't only be a story about little or less and lower or lost, uh, but it's also about how we can change the narrative and actually find opportunities. So we'll do that by first really diving into where we stand today in our industry and how cost of living is uh, further affecting that for the time to come. Um, then thirdly, we'll... Uh, linger a little bit on what that really means for, for brand value in, in this, uh, uh, this times of continued uncertainty, but more than anything, how you can still thrive in spite of everything, uh, what's happening and how to influence behavior. Um, and when we are, um, when we were preparing for today's webinar and just chatting about Carmen and I, um, it was already so easy to really find examples of coping strategies just in everyone's daily life. So even if you're not the most uh, price conscious uh, shopper, perhaps, we are all now really part of this collective state of mind of higher prices and more rational behavior. So for example, just thinking about it, uh, probably not more than 30 seconds, I already had three examples of things that I have changed. So whether it's uh, changing uh, my brand of oatmeal, which would come in a nice box, a brand, all very convenient for pouring, less mess, to the much cheaper version that just comes in a little wrapper, leaves mess, but okay, for now it's good enough, to also other choices where I, I really want to stick to my brand like coffee, but I find myself shopping around much more, um, in my case online, to really find the best the best buy and then stockpile like crazy. So now in my basement, I have like 20 cans of coffee stocked up. Um, or uh, snubbing my daughter from really having her favorite cupcake, uh, unicorn cupcakes from the fancy cupcake place <laughs> down the street uh, and deciding to just go for decorate your own because I thought all the costs were getting quite exaggerated. Um, now, of course, everyone's situation is different and um, I'm based in the Netherlands, which is actually, uh, in terms of people struggling in budget, one of the countries which has like the most positive look out. Uh, but Carmen, for example, she's placed uh, in, uh, situated in Spain, uh, which has one of the highest amount of shoppers uh, struggling. Um, and yeah, maybe you can tell us about some of your changing behaviors. Thanks, Lenica, and hi, everyone. Like Lenica said, I'm Carmen. Um, so for me, a behavior that's definitely uh, changed or perhaps accentuated more in these times is around shopping locally and organic. So shopping bio and ecological products is an absolute priority for me. Um, similar to Lenica, I shop around a lot more, but I make sure that those products that I'm buying haven't got a strong carbon footprint. So sustainability and the environment's a big kind of top concern for me. So as much as I love blueberries, if I see they've been flown in from Peru, I'll probably won't buy them and I'll wait until they're in season in, in, in Europe or Spain. But on the contrast inside, somewhere where I've sacrificed a lot and when Lenica and I were discussing and preparing for this, for me, it was it was something that I'd never really thought about before was home care products. So where before I admittedly would have 
just bought, you know, branded products that I that I knew and loved and that I'd seen advertising for over the years. I've now switched quite heavily to private labels and I do a lot more shopping around. So I go, I'll go more to kind of discounters to buy my home care products because I can see kind of some significant savings there. So it was interesting looking at a day in our lives and how they how they differ. Thanks, Annika. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, and of course, these are just uh, illustrations and rest assured, we won't be talking about our own uh, experiences uh, for the rest of the webinar. Um, of course, we have proper sources uh, for this as well. Um, so uh, for today, we'll be drawing quite uh, heavily from our latest edition of our behavior change study, uh, which um, uh, was fielded quite recently in which we cover 18 countries. So we are uh, expanding our reach also this time into France and Spain and the UK. Um, and since we've been doing this in a few waves as well, it gives us quite nice um, opportunity to all, also really deep dive into not only the effects of cost of living crisis and how it's changing behaviors, but also how the nuances are shifting throughout this crisis uh, from a year back, half year back to today. Um, and of course, also looking uh, back a little bit further. Now, before we really dive into, um, I would say this this view on where the industry stands these days, um, I'm really wondering how you, uh, as um, as peers in this industry, really view, um, I would say, the developments that are coming up in the next month. So, rather stating, are you quite optimistic about? Um, shoppers may be finding a little bit more room in their budgets and maybe going back to normalcy. Or are you quite pessimistic in believing that uh, shoppers will really intensify their behaviors even much more further, um, saving more, down trading, watching prices, waiting for promotions much more because we haven't seen the top of the, the cost of living crisis yet. So there's a prompted a nice little uh, poll. So I'm just curious to see and please answer it just for your situation, your country, your markets, uh, what you believe uh, will be predominant. So since it was such a simple question, at least in terms of A, B answers. I don't know if we can already view some results. Yes, there we go. So, um, okay, that's that's quite a clear message. So um, the vast majority of, of you believe that uh, that we haven't seen the, the top of the crisis yet and that situation will actually, um, I would say, worsen a little bit in terms of rational shopping in that sense. Um, so yeah, let's go see what, what we, uh, we found on that matter. So I can start with a little bit of a, a, a positive note. Uh, in the sense that uh, consumer uh, confidence is actually recovering. Uh, and it's now at its, um, I would say, eight uh, consecutive increase. Um, so there's there's quite a, a stable positive development. But uh, however, it's also uh, really important to note that this, the situation where we stand today is still even lower than the lowest point that we hit in the COVID crisis. So we really are coming from a, a, a long, long way um, and we're definitely not near a positive sentiment yet. Um, and of course, also the situation is quite uh, different than to the COVID situation or exactly the opposite with uh, back then more ample savings since we couldn't spend and then um, yeah probably uh, being able to to make you know the choices you'd want at least when it relates to FMCG uh, for in-store to uh, having to I would say uh, being forced to pay more and see your uh, savings evaporate in in a lot of uh, cases um, so also the I would say the yeah, really the, the sentiment around this confidence is quite uh, different. Now, if we look at um, economic outlook, um, so there's some, so for sure there's some positive notes, right? So consumer confidence is on the rise slowly. Um, commodity prices are stabilizing, uh, shipping costs are falling, but at the other hand, it's also uh, real wages have plunged 
uh, and this is really leading as well to a lot of social unrest um, and um, looking at expectations for uh, global growth we can see that uh, according to chief economists across uh, the world especially in europe we're still pretty much in for a period of stagflation so very low or no economic growth and high inflation um, so all in all that outlook is not uh, that uh, positive now a little bit contrary, of course, uh, in our industry, the past few years have actually meant an extraordinary period of um, unprecedented growth. So the past three years, uh, FMCG value has grown as much as in the previous eight. Um, and 2022 has really seen an acceleration again of that growth uh, everywhere except in Asia, where food inflation is lower than 10%. Um, but as said, Contrary to in the to the COVID uh, period when it was about like how can I basically spend more, uh, shoppers are now faced with wanting to spend less uh, but forcefully spending more, uh, and we can really see this in a, a switch in which channels benefit the most. So the key growing channel across the world has been discount. Um, which has grown uh, 10%, uh, whereas uh, during COVID times it was uh, e-commerce. Now, this is a um, unprecedented growth that we haven't seen in the past decade. Um, and it might be of, of concern to many of you where this is headed, but it's important to keep in mind that with this private label rise, there's really three uh, factors that, of course, contribute to this rising. So for sure, we're seeing shoppers going more to discounters and also buying more categories when they go. Um, there's down trading within, uh, I would say, service supermarkets uh, where they switch from brand to private label. But the vast majority of this growth actually coming from a higher than average price increase. So this is something quite important to keep in the back of our minds that a lot of the, the value increase we're seeing is uh, simply because in uh, in the private label atmosphere, and especially in uh, discount private label, prices have risen faster than uh, brand prices have. So basically just capturing more, uh, more value increase. Now, then correcting really for this, um, this, this impact of Spent um, trips might be a really good proxy for relevance, right? So how often do you actually frequent a channel to do your shopping there? Um, and then we can really see that that still discounters have grown versus the year before. Now, also in the back of your mind, uh, this is against the situation where frequency has not recovered from COVID. So uh, only in Western Europe, we see frequency picking up. Um, um, so the fact that there is a 6% growth in occasions means simply a lot of more shoppers just enter the doors of discounters to, to do a purchase there. Um, but then you can still see that actually correcting for, for value and just looking at trips, it's still e-commerce that globally has, has captured the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest increase. Now, another uh, quite... Um, I would say relevant <laughs> um, point would be that it's actually uh, not directly related to um, the, the level of price increase, how much private label grows. So uh, it's not a saying or a given that the more a prices increase in a category that automatically shoppers react uh, and change to private label. So there is like no linear relation between higher uh, category price growth and uh, private label volumes. And the same goes for discounter volumes. So all in all, shoppers, they think more in absolutes rather than relatives. Okay, so it's not a calculated choice. It's an every time that when prices rise more than average, then I will switch uh, to private label, uh, which of course has a lot to do with the nature of categories and whether they're nice to have or must haves. Now, a true marking point, which started in the beginning of uh, this year, is that for now, for the first time uh, since uh, this permanent crisis, that we are really seeing that volumes are uh, dropping again below what well normal levels uh, of the pre-COVID situation, so 2019. So meaning that all in all, shoppers are now taking quite drastic uh, uh, measures, really, 
um, and products are simply falling off the basket and being left out. Um, and this cutting down again is also not necessarily correlated to the level of price change across categories. So it's not again given that the higher the price change, the more the volume will drop. But of course, later we'll look into which are the categories that are most at risk. So um, interestingly, of course, um, there's been a, a little bit of a, uh, um, a change over this perma crisis from in the beginning, um, uh, focusing a lot on more on on stockpiling, on uh, premiumization to right now, of course, lots of planning, focus, frugality. And the question really is whether 2023 and a little bit beyond will be a, a tipping point or whether this will just further intensify. So again, I have a little bit of a question for you um, in which way you think really the concerns have grown the most since past year. So really looking against the, the start of the, the cost of living crisis, um, whether it's budget concerns, safety concerns, environmental concerns or health concerns. Um, and I can see that it is mainly uh, budget concerns <laughs> that are on your minds. I hope you all had enough time to, to vote. Um, but actually, uh, and interestingly, when we look more into these developments uh, of cost of living, uh, we can see that it's for sure economic concerns are still primary. So 51% of shoppers is uh, stating that economic and budget concerns are their number one concern. And this has risen uh, compared to last um, year. Uh, number two is physical health and number three would be my own or family uh, safety concerns. However, um, I would state that as this perma crisis is normalizing a little bit and the panic phase uh, uh, is, 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 is over, um, there is a little bit more of mental space to, to really think about these other things that were really high <laughs> top of mind uh, before cost of living kicked in. So actually the top growing concerns um, are uh, really related to, to the environment. So climate change, waste and pollution uh, are two of the concerns that are rising fastest versus last year, uh, as well as mental health. And the, this latter point is really, especially amongst the younger generations as these effects of this permanent crisis um, yeah, just keep on, uh, seem endless. Uh, and there's actually also countries in which climate change uh, by now outranks budget concerns, and these are Austria, Germany, and Italy. So against this backdrop of yes, budget concerns really number one, but also a little bit of I would say mental space again for for thinking a bit in a broader perspective. Um, we of course are looking into how is the budget situation for uh, for our shoppers really uh, evolving around uh, Europe in all of these 18 countries. And there we can see that it's 37% of shoppers that are really struggling financially to make ends meet or that simply don't have enough to make it to the end of the month. Uh, so that's more than one in three, and this level has dropped slightly. Uh, and uh, to the benefit of the comfortable that don't have to limit themselves in any way, this number has increased slightly. Um, of course, there's some really different country dimensions if you uh, uh, would dive into that. Um, so there's countries where it's especially high with being Spain and Italy and France, or for example, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, Hungary, uh, Serbia, Croatia. Um, but there's also developments uh, versus last year. So there's two countries which uh, particularly of interest with a rising amount of struggling being Hungary and also maybe not to the expectations of many, but Sweden. Um, so the situation is, is frankly also that there's not one speed in which this crisis is unfolding and also the dynamics behind it are quite uh, different depending on the socio-economic and political situation. 
But what is a fact, if when we look across uh, all of Europe, that shoppers are, I would say, almost permanently <laughs> for now set in this less for less mindset. So shoppers much more state that they rather only buy what they need rather than what they like. And they are much more price oriented rather than quality oriented. When a few years back, this balance was a little bit more in favor uh, or tipping towards uh, quality. Um, also, the amount of shoppers that's planning to spend less on FMCG is 65%, so two thirds still pl spend to uh, plan to spend less. So this is very much in line with your expectations uh, uh, in our first poll of the situation, uh, um, perhaps deteriorate, deteriorating a little bit in the, in the coming months. Um, and well, Private label or brand preference, let's let's call it a, let's call it a tie. Um, but yeah, we can also see there the skill tipping uh, more and more to private label. So this situation really means that when it comes to taking action and 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 how shoppers can really strategize with different options that they have to keep their spend in check. Uh, we have not seen the end of this. So there will be for sure further rationalization of shopping. Um, if you look at all the, the beautiful bars and the, the actions they can take. So the number one action is checking prices more. So 64% state that they will do this even more than before. Um, and this is also stronger felt than it was a half year ago or a year ago, which is the little uh, dots you can see. So you can see that for almost all of these behaviors, whether it's checking uh, and waiting for promotions, um, keeping the total basket amount low, uh, switching to cheaper retailers, switching to cheaper brands, all of these uh, behaviors are intensifying as the crisis is uh, stretching out. Um, there's well, a little note maybe in, a, in line of a little bit of optimism when it comes to um, uh, treating oneself uh, with something special. So uh, we really saw a, a deep, I would say, uh, low points in fall when there was uh, loads of shoppers that stated, I'll definitely do this less and less and less. And now there seems to be a little bit of a bounce back to the earlier situation uh, of shoppers saying, okay, maybe I will do this a little bit more than before. Um, and also the same would go for regional. So uh, local, regional, national uh, buying uh, was at a low point in fall and it seems to be bouncing back a little bit right now. Now, um, of course, um, not all um, uh, categories are at a equal risk, right? So there's a few categories that uh, shoppers single out much more uh, when uh, uh, they think about like in which which categories will I most likely change my behavior because I'm worried about prices. Um, so if you read with me, that's uh, on the bottom, low change to the left, high change to the right. So the more to the right, the higher the change will be. So we mainly find these gratification nice to have categories there. So alcoholic beverages, confectionery, cosmetics. Now, they're colored green because actually comparing to earlier uh, measurements, uh, still these categories are the top three categories, but the amount of shoppers signaling them is declining a little bit. So the situation for these categories might be improving. Um, on the other hand, you can really see shoppers having to even shift much more to, I would say, their daily needs and also to their, uh, to their, I would say, the, the the stuff they have in the pantry usually. So canned foods, but also fresh foods, uh, frozen foods. They're all categories in which um, more people are now actually stating uh, that they might uh, make changes because they're worried about prices. And we can see that if you look at how satisfied shoppers are really are with what's on offer in these categories, there's no direct relation. It's not because shoppers are less satisfied that they're making changes because it's this engineering of what can I miss, what has a high um, uh, perceived uh, saving when I make a change uh, that really makes uh, shoppers single uh, out certain categories. Now, what I found, um, I would say, 
really striking when you look at how shoppers cope over time uh, in this uh, perma crisis. You can see that for sure in the beginning, uh, for all of these categories, uh, it was mainly about buying cheaper, buying on offer or buying less. Uh, but then as the crisis goes on, uh, you can see a shift happening there. So uh, still, of course, these are by far the, the, the most important coping strategies. But I think there is a little bit of um, importance in the nuance here. When you look into not buying any longer, which I would say is like the ultimate coping strategy when you really are at the end of your abilities here, is that this is on the rise. So more and more shoppers are actually saying, I'm just going to not buy it anymore. So this goes for alcoholic beverages, confectionery, cosmetics, uh, frozen foods or categories you might uh, stock up typically on, um, um, really, of course, posing a threat for further volume development, but also um, if you're branding these categories, a high risk of your category not even ending up in the basket anymore. Now, for categories where not buying is not really uh, a choice, so that goes for fresh categories, but also for uh, lots of categories in, for example, home care, you can also see this switch happening um, but rather uh, switching to shoppers, mm, focusing a lot on buying it, for example, elsewhere and, and making more of an effort, uh, really, and this is maybe in line with what Carmen also said as, as, as her example, uh, to find the best buy. So we're expecting a little bit of a change in, in how shoppers uh, feel they, they must cope with the situation today. Now, this strategizing and planning, of course, also affects where you shop. So looking ahead, so we've seen discounters rise. We, we, we know uh, shoppers are increasingly shopping around. Uh, small basket cherry picking is really on the rise. Um, but also looking ahead and asking shoppers, where do you think uh, you will shop? <laughs> uh, please tell us your main retailer. And will you shop there uh, more, shop there less? same stop shopping there you can see that about one in five shoppers across europe says like i uh, will basically decrease my loyalty or stop shopping at my main retailer um, and this is a little bit stronger in uh, western and southern europe and there's two countries where this is particularly high being france and sweden now and if we then look at some of the 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 most uh preferred retailers across Europe. So ranked, for, uh, sorry, ranked from the amount of shoppers that indicates this is my main retailer within a country. Um, we can see that some of those highly preferred retailers are at a lot of risk. So for example, Mercadona uh, in, uh, in Carmen's uh, home market is, um, uh, is really running a, a high uh, risk of shoppers um, planning to shop there less. And across the board, so this already shows a little bit in this chart, uh, but also if you look into all the different countries and the, the retailer list, you can see that Lidl is a place much more favorable. So sometimes shoppers stating they'll increase or at least the decrease uh, is, um, uh, the, the intended decrease is much less than for, for other retailers in most countries, I must add. Now, of course, um this switching and shopping around not only affects uh, retailer growth but it also really affects uh brands because uh consumers really do form habits um so we all know there's no such thing as a, as a loyal shopper uh, but there is some, such a thing as inertia so the likelihood that your next purchase uh, is the same brand as your last purchase is 40 percent at the second purchase and this even increases to 60% if you've already bought the same brand on two subsequent occasions before. Now, this is true for big brands, I must say. But these habits are really easily disrupted when uh, shoppers uh, switch retailers. So this likelihood of being purchased is cut in half. So that's quite a severe consequence just because shoppers are out of their uh, typical routine. And this really brings us to the first um, I would say um, order of business today is that it's really all about being easy to be bought. Um, we've seen that shoppers will strategize a lot 
uh, thinking from a total basket perspective, total value. So it's really about making sure that you prompt the category and category occasions in the mind of the shopper about being where the shopper is. So having your distribution in order and then especially stand out on the shelf. So investing heavily in conspicuity at the point of sale. Now in this situation with a lot of shoppers making these whole basket decisions uh, and carefully weighing uh, um, their spend, uh, of course brings the question like, what does this mean for, for brand value or brand differentiation, differentiation or brand uh, opportunities? Um, so I was uh, also really curious to see um, how many shoppers in Europe you think actually feel happy with the inflation situation as it helps them uh, find new ways to save? So is this 0%, 10, 20, 30, or 50? Okay, so let's go to the answers, I guess. We're already there. Uh, so majority thinks uh, 10%. Well, uh, later on, I'll disclose it's actually a little bit higher. Um, and why is this important? Because it, it already really shows that there's a lot of differentiation as well in sentiment. But we'll touch up on this uh, later on. Um, most importantly, um, it really shows that this this engineering of the basket and this taking decisions from a total basket perspective is really a mixed sum of functional and emotional factors. So on the one hand, of course, uh, sh there's a lot of shoppers that must make changes or invariably still make changes, even if they don't really have to, just because in times of crisis, you're more in a collective state of mind that affects the way you behave and you think and you act. Um, either downtrading, buying promotions, well, we've seen all of this. But on the other hand, there's also a lot of things that shoppers do not necessarily want to compromise on, and they might maybe even go to greater lengths to protect uh, their interests here uh, in order not to, to, to downtrade also on their principles, right? Um, so they'll go to greater lengths to, to make sure they can buy what they want. But if there's a cheaper alternative that's just as good, they for sure go for it. And this, I think, is very well um, um, uh, illustrated, really, by some of the shifts that are happening in the, in the German market, where you can uh, really see, um, if we look into trend development, so we look at convenience products, sustainability uh, related products, uh, products that offer additional health benefits and lifestyle premium, like more wow experience. Um, interestingly, you see that again here as well, private label is adding a lot to these trends. Um, so for sure, on the one hand, um, that that is in, in, in a big sense part because they are rising their prices more, raising their prices more as we saw. But it's also for a big part, uh, we cannot deny that, that now private labels are part and parcel in driving trends. Um, but the second important point, point lies in this chart, which is that especially it's the mid-tier brands that are struggling in these times. Okay, so um, as uh, even in spite like price differences may be uh, decreasing, uh, it's increasingly hard for mid-tier brands to really uh, differentiate themselves. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the situation um, that we're facing, in which there's perfect conditions really for strong label presence. Uh, because typically uh, in categories with um, low advertising done by brands or low innovation activity um, or a higher uh, similarity in packaging uh, or smaller differences in perceived value uh, and quality, um, uh, private label shares tend to be 30% higher in these categories. And also it's good to keep in the back of our minds that private label is actually 10% more likely to keep the share they win uh, on the long term, so after five and 10 years. Uh, so it's also harder to get them back. back. And this has also a lot to do with the fact that um, there's really 
this game is really played on another level, I would say, whereas before it was more about cheapness and margins. Uh, private labels are acting very much as brands these days in offering, of course, high quality products. They're present in all categories, uh, but also increasing promotional pressure, high advertising spending, um, and also um, also mimicking, of course, a lot uh, in, in packaging. Now, there's a further complicating uh, factor in this is the shopper sentiment. So I asked before how many shoppers you think are actually happy with cost of living because they found new ways to save. Well, that's actually one in five shoppers across Europe. Now, of course, there's a huge difference here between countries in which there's a lot of shoppers with struggling budgets or shoppers with a more comfortable position. Um, but the the I would say the quite striking uh, and a little bit, um, I would say, uh, terrifying news is that one in three shoppers is actually feeling angry at brands and retailers because they feel they have risen prices more than they should or that the situation calls for. And there's, of course, this shift in, 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 in brand reputation and sentiment and emotional connection to brands that needs to be mended um, moving ahead. And I'll let you just ponder on these images for, for a second. Um, yeah, because these are messages and, and, and um, sometimes subliminal, but, but shoppers are feeling sometimes, of course, um, cheated. So then what's the, the way out of this and what's the, what's the good news? Well, the, the, the important thing is that really um, uh, making ourselves conscious that there is actually a limit to uh, how much private label is beneficial, uh, both for margins, but also for retailer loyalty, and that the more private label actually ends up in the basket and comprises the whole basket, it actually depresses these uh, gross margin levels, but also depresses retailer loyalty. So brands do have a quite significant uh, role to play in in developing, of course, uh, value, added value, but also in um, attracting shoppers to retailers. Um, and looking at uh, brands that are winning brands, so that have been really able to um, expand uh, their uh, their market share and keep the one market share. Um, there's a few truths to uh, strategic factors that really contribute or really determine these uh, winning brands. Uh, and always, regardless of how the economic situation is, uh, these winning brands are marked by having a really extensive dis distribution and really betting and going for uh, market leadership. Um, but also that there is different rules, whether you're in time of ex market expansion or market contraction. In times of market contraction, it's much more uh, beneficial. It uh, has a much uh, better ROI to inf invest in high advertising and really uh, focus on positioning an umbre umbrella brand. Rather, when we talk about times of expansion, um, it's about extending long line length and, and premiumization. Um, and um, I think this is maybe a good moment to, to check up with Carmen, because if this is the constellation of what makes up winning brands and how you can play with this uh, in times of contraction and times of expansion, um, yeah, I'm curious to hear your professional view on how that really translates into tactics for the cost of living situation. Thanks, Annika. Thank you. So we very briefly wanted to touch upon how kind of all these insights and keeping brands top of mind and the, the kind of things you need to be doing reflect into marketing activity, which is always interesting. And when we were looking at it, it really distills down to three elements for me. One is multi-channel experiences with the operative word being experiences there, uh, being conscious beyond price, so bringing in the health and sustainability elements, and then moving to the money well spent. Um, so not so much about money saving, but more about money well spent. So if we look at the 
at the first one that I mentioned, the multi-channel experiences, you need to really make sure you're reaching all your shoppers across both digital and traditional channels, speaking to their needs, whether that's through virtual shopping experiences, really targeted campaigns or influencer marketing, you really need to make sure you're covering all the t all the touch points possible and, and experiences that tailor to them. So it's a it's quite an obvious thing. We all know about it. It's no longer a one size fits all, but it's now moving beyond that to making sure that you're creating unique experiences that then shoppers, buyers associate to your brand. So when I was trying to think of something that I personally have seen that I found very innovative in the last few years, it's the Amazon Fresh stores. I realized they're not widespread across Europe, but in the UK, when I went um, last back to London a few months ago, I experienced um, an Amazon Fresh store. And for me, that's true innovation. You go in, you scan your Amazon app and you take anything off the shelf, you can put it back and it charges directly within 30 minutes after your purchase to your app. For me, that's extremely innovative. It's a unique experience, but it's also very convenient, which we've seen is on the rise. You know, it's something shoppers want. They want convenience, they want ease, they're time poor. So meeting those needs is actually um, a unique experience that they might not get elsewhere. And then additionally, Lenik has spoken about the kind of global social discontent. And we know many shoppers are struggling and, and feeling helpless. And it's important that they feel seen and heard by brands at every stage of their shopper journey. So proving that you kind of understand their individual needs and empower them is going to make them loyal to your brand. And an example of that for me is seen in a lot of um, supermarket reward programs, loyalty schemes. So for a personal example, for me, I shop a lot at Carrefour here in Spain because they've got a loyalty scheme that gives back in, in actual money coupons. So I get an I get an uh, alert on my app. I use the app. You know, the latest product you bought is now on discount. Why not use your coupon for that? For me, that creates loyalty to that supermarket because they're understanding that I've got a need. Um, I might be struggling to buy certain products. Um, and the fact that I feel heard by them and empowered to then, hey, actually, I've got this coupon. I can use it is going to make me loyal to that brand. So there's two con contrasting examples there and for multi-channel experiences. One is innovative. It doesn't necessarily speak to the cost of living crisis. And then the other one does. The second element I mentioned was being conscious beyond price. So making sure you're speaking to the health and sustainability concerns, which we've seen are rising once again. Um, so with that in mind, as marketeers, um, which I'm sure we've got many on the call, um, it's around, are you keeping that in mind when it comes to your campaign strategies, as well as your product development? Are you taking actions as a brand um, that reflects the wants and needs of customers in this space? Are you offering, have you got the right offering for health conscious shoppers? So have you innovated in your product line to make sure you're meeting those changing needs. And then as well, when it comes to product development, are you keeping sustainability in mind, packaging, other areas that you could be talking uh, talking about? Um, for me, a big element here is also authenticity. So there is obviously a lot of doubt with, um, with shoppers in terms of how true, how true brands have been to this. Are they jumping on a bandwagon? Wagon? So making sure that it's really reflected in internally as well as externally and that you actions kind of um, speak louder than words. And then the final one, um, which for me is quite is quite clear, it's this money well spent. So cost of living crisis continues, and but consumers still want to kind of find those little moments of enjoyment. And Lena and I spoke about it as escapism. So kind of, you know, I know I have to save money, but where can I find small, small bits of enjoyment that don't really conflict with my um, wallet? And that's the money well spent. Um, they can only spend their money once, so they want to make sure it counts. And when I was trying to think of an example that that could work quite well, it's actually quite hard, right? So something that I feel I'm getting value for money for, so I'm happy spending, but that isn't kind of taking a big chunk out of my budget share. And uh, for me, sorry to put a bit of a comic element into it, it's good quality toilet paper. So that's where I'm not willing to sacrifice, but I feel like if I buy great quality toilet paper, I'm going to be very happy. I'm going to feel like it's money well spent. So I'm willing to spend that little bit more um, to get that sense of um, escapism and enjoyment. So thank you, Lenica. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for this uh, this good example. Um, but I think it does really show that it's it's very much also about these these. Um, I would say the, the the little things these days. And if we're talking about making the bridge to our next section of like what then really influences behavior, um, it's 
it's really also not about like making the the hugest differentiation but it's these little things that matter for shoppers so it's if you're getting chased by a lion you don't need to outrun the lion but you just need to outrun the people running with you so where can we actually find those nuances that make shoppers uh tick and make them actually you know sway your way and when we're uh looking at shoppers it's important to understand that they will take something from every moment in a crisis uh learn and 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 keep it for the next period right so the pragmatism we have been seeing and that they have developed over uh the past year this will stick but more and more uh as also it becomes old news and um um you also might might go to greater lengths to find these these little pleasures or or to defend your principles in certain areas it's really much more about engineering so yes frugality focus planning but engineering more carefully on downsizing where you really must but also really defending and making an effort where you can uh, so this brings to the second order of business which is really about how do you end up then in the basket as a brand really without compromise uh, and for this you must of course really uh, demonstrate both functional and an emotional advantage uh, and also in in the area of responsibility, of course, as we see, this is rising again on shopper again, uh, agenda. Really show that it's not at any costs that that your products are are produced and that that shoppers can uh, um, purchase, right? So this all goes into this, uh, which I think is is just the key word for the next period or key phrase. Really, it's about money well spent uh, because it caters to this idea of value for money, but spending well means also means without maybe harming other things like the environment or harmful for my health, right? So how can you combine this idea and change the narrative really from focus, focus on saving money to money well spent? Well, this of course has everything to do with superior performance uh, as a brand, having a larger assortment typically still uh, for shoppers to choose from and to find these nuances uh, that cater to their needs but also of course about uh, having sensible price thresholds so the differences uh, with private label are not too high uh, and offer that additional benefit now um, of course advertising is, is a big part of this but if we look into two other important brand levers that not only have a functional need but also strong emotional response of course promotions and introduction. So if we dive a little bit into the first promotions, of course, they serve various purposes. So this is uh, in the German market, but it, it's as good as any uh, any market as an example uh, that, of course, uh, promotions are tools for sure used to optimize budgets. So struggling households, heavily relying on promotions to really make the, the choices work that they want. But it also, for example, it can be a tool for households that are quite comfortable, but they just love the thrill of, of finding that promotion uh, and that, that little release of dopamine that comes with it. Um, and then there is actually a difference in how shoppers uh, experience promotions. So uh, asking about what are the most rewarding promotions uh, in the sense of I feel <laughs> a, a strong sense of reward when I, when I buy this uh, promotion uh, well non surprisingly probably it's price offs that are top of the chart okay so for the vast majority of shoppers price offs are the most rewarding type of promotion but there is a difference uh, between for example uh, struggling households and comfortable houses where you see that this price signal so this very direct gain is a little bit less important or less rewarding if you have a bigger budget um, uh, on the other hand, bigger budgets, for example, uh, are more open to discounts, which you might call dynamic discounts. So discounts that happen when products are close to the expiration date. So this is way less appealing to, to struggling households and more appealing to households with wide budgets. Why? Well, because of course, if you shop and you find this type of budget, um, sorry, this type of promotion, as uh, coming from a well-off situation, then it's, hey, it's something I can do also to help uh, combat food waste, 
why not? On the other hand, if this is a choice that you have to make because it's cheaper, uh, you are actually buying a product that is, you're sacrificing freshness, or at least you maybe seemingly are sacrificing freshness because you might not would have chosen that, but you have to choose it because it's cheaper. So it has a totally different um, experience uh, emotionally when you are uh, uh, buying that that particular um, promotion. And also, for example, cashbacks that are a way of, okay, I buy something now and later on I'll get my money back. They're way more appealing for uh, for comfortable shoppers because they can afford it to to wait until they get the, the value uh, incentive back later on. And for uh, struggling shoppers, which we saw are many across Europe, it's much, much more about a immediate price signal. Now we know promotions, of course, have a very strong short-term effect. And in these times, it's uh, quite tempting, of course, to really uh, um, uh, strongly uh, put our money into uh, promotions uh, and uh, intensify the promotion um, uh, strategy. Uh, but the long-term effect should not be lost out of sight. So uh, again, looking into the German markets, uh, so yes, very high short-term effects, right? If we have a big analysis across loads of brands in loads of category, typically on a weekly basis, promotion will help you uh, sell, no, let's say five times as much as otherwise. Now, looking a little bit more midterm to this, so taking into account pre and post purchases, and are we actually adding value or just making shoppers wait longer or just switching them within our own portfolio, um, typically, promotions on the midterm add about 60% um, uh, incremental volume. But then what about the, the long, longer term view uh, for real brand growth? So um, looking here uh, uh, on a longer time trajectory, so uh, over uh, three years comparing 2021 to 2019, and really relating changes in uh, promotion intensity, distribution, and assortment to the performance of these key KPIs that we measure, penetration, frequency, pack per trip, market share, price per pack, we can surely see that promotions also on the longer term have a uh, quite positive relation to penetration growth and to intensification, so buying more per trip. Other hand, there is a negative tendency related to uh, a price reduction or price paid reduction, of course, and frequency. So looking in long term, promotions are good, yes, to build and attract buyers. And we all know how important penetration is for uh, growing brands, but it doesn't necessarily uh, mean anything for your absolute value position in the market. Now, interestingly, looking into assortment, uh, and changing uh, the, the product simply on offer. Uh, yes, a penetration effect, but it has a much stronger effect on adding value uh, uh, overall uh, to your brand. Now, these new products or, or playing with assortment are quite critical, especially uh, when it is uh, uh, done by big brands because um, the share coming from, uh, if we look in winning brands, they have quite a uh, added value market share, either coming from innovations or from renovations. Um, renovations being just a different type of flavor, format size, taste, things like this. Uh, for number one brands, this effect is even much more uh, pronounced. Um, so especially renovations um, really can add a lot of um, market share, of course. And good innovations or good introductions, of course, have this emotional appeal to shoppers and therefore also this incremental potential of adding uh, not only value for your brand, uh, growing the category beyond the core, but also adding exclusive buyers. So a good example, for example, uh, is Aperol Spritz in these ready-to-go uh, bottles that has really been able to, to capture uh, additional uh, buyers and additional revenue for the brand. Now, if we look into uh, what types of uh, benefits we might want to, uh, that, that resonate most with shoppers, we can really, I would say, uh, uh, 
you know, divide them into some some more functional, some more emotional. And there's really five dimensions that we look into. So that's value for money, health, uh, sustainability, convenience, and this exceptional wow experience. And um, looking all across Europe and asking like, how satisfied are you actually with these dimensions, how well they're fulfilled in FMCG? It's mainly value for money that comes off the worst, but also uh, exceptional wow experience, especially uh, in some of the, the, the Eastern European countries uh, is really uh, uh, well la la lagging behind. But also, for example, sustainability um, is not that uh, positively uh, appreciated at this uh, moment. So then, of course, we need to find out what are really the, the winning benefits. And there's, I would say, three ways of looking at this. And that all has to do with their ability to really command the response. Now, a response can mean different things. A response can mean uh, this is an added value for shoppers that really has a high reach and a high potential of influencing a lot of shoppers. But it also might be that it's a a benefit that for lo for shoppers has a high premium value, so they're worth paying extra for. And then thirdly, uh, it might be that these are the, the specific benefits that are actually more related or associated in uh, terms of creating satisfaction among shoppers. Now, looking at the first one, the, the influencers or the benefits that have the highest reach among shoppers saying, yes, uh, this will influence my purchase behavior if a product has this particular uh, benefit, we can see it is pretty much around value for money and health. So lowest price guarantee, staying fresh for longer, but also 100% natural, supporting the immune system and preventative health in terms of heart and vascular disease. These health uh, benefits are a little bit stronger in Eastern Europe than they are in Western Europe. Uh, the value for money are, well, equally uh, strong in, in both. If we look into top five benefits that command a premium price, um, we can see ultra fresh ultra fresh actually topping the list, followed by 100% natural, uh, professional quality, but also versatility. So being able to use a product in various ways and still the sense of time saving uh, being um, the, I would say the, the benefits that are most commanding uh, a premium. Diving a little bit further into this value for money idea, of course, it's it would be silly to ask, would you be willing to pay more for something uh, that is actually <laughs> uh, meant to, to save you money or, or, or bring you value for money? So we looked at it more from an angle, like which of these make you feel more that it is money well spent? Um, and this really evolves a lot about guarantees. So um, shoppers have the highest feeling of money well spent when they have a low price guarantee, but also a basic quality guarantee. Um, beyond that, it's also about staying fresh for longer and having a special loyalty programs. And there's, of course, a lot of alternative ways of saving money and, and, and building this, this money well spent idea. So it's about uh, maybe um, avoiding spillage uh, so you get the most for your money or also maybe because the 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 product simply helps you save money in another area uh, like the example on the bottom from Vanish. Um, so finally to round off also a big question so we saw green uh, concerns uh, rising so where does it really leave shoppers in terms of sustainability, they might not be on top of these charts when it comes to premium worthiness of reach, but they have a really widespread reach uh, these days, both in Eastern Europe and in uh, Western Europe, uh, with a slight differentiation where we can see in, in, in Western Europe, it's tipping a little bit more towards carbon neutrality um, and seasonality and animal welfare on top of, uh, I would say, the, the learned behaviors by now of plastic avoidance uh, and, 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 and things as such. Whereas in Eastern Europe, it's uh, quite heavily around, um, I would say, the protection of resources, refills, but also brand reputation plays a bigger role in um, influencing buying behavior. 
And considering uh, paying a premium, there's actually less people in Eastern Europe that say that they're not willing at all to pay for any uh, of these uh, aspects. So it really is a catching up of this uh, region in Europe when it comes to green concerns. Now, if you would comprise them all of these benefits into one, there's for sure a winning corner of uh, benefits that are both able to to reach a lot of shoppers and influence their their choices, and at the same time really command a higher uh, higher price. So just to name a few, it's ultra fresh, uh, but also locality, professional quality being quite important, uh, tailoring to personal health needs, supporting immune system, microplastic free. These are all benefits uh, that that really are, uh, are are well. If you have to make a big bet, that would be safe choices. Um, and you can really see they, they come from all the five dimensions. So it's not all about value for money for sure. Uh, so one minute more to round off. Um, satisfaction um, can be really driven more than anything by um, uh, premium experience. So we've done a, 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 a bit of a correspondence analysis to really see which of these uh, dimensions is more closely related to dissatisfied shoppers. And we found that it's really about this premium and wow effect. And then if you dive into this premium and wow effect, dissatisfaction is really uh, driven by more a sense of security. Like I want to be sure that when I spend my money, it's worth it and I don't make the wrong choice. So it's about professional quality, also about like certification and quality seals. For us, those that are already satisfied and, and increasing their satisfaction, it's much more about these hedonistic things such as luxury packaging or uh, exotic uh, flavors or, or variants. So final slide, one minute over. So hopefully uh, you're still hanging in there. Um, um, this idea of uh, money well spent it's really i think key and it's all about restating the category in shoppers relevant set and really advertising occasions first if your category is not in the basket it will be quite tough to get bought it's also about redefining what you bring to the category with functional and emotional and responsible value so money well spent uh, and for sure there's a lot of benefits that shoppers still uh, look for it's about being where the shopper is and being easy to be bought. Um, so ensure conspicuity and consistency at the point of sale and invest in second placements. Um, encourage trial, as shoppers do tend to switch more uh, with an effective promotion strategy and really focus on incremental innovations. And it's not about um, outrunning the lion here. And don't go silent, uh, especially in advertising, which is so key in these, uh, these times. Uh, but in this ex advertising, really be sure that you explore, yes, the dual need for security and saving, but also with this sense of dopamine. And especially for struggling households, it's about empowerment, making them feel uh, heard and also giving them a sense of being in control uh, of making the choices that they actually would want to make. So hopefully we've been able to give you some uh, key pointers on how to uh, master behavior change. Your questions will answer um, uh, later one-on-one -on -one via email. So uh, we already saw lots of questions coming in. So many thanks for that. And um, yeah, if you're interested in more, be sure to find more on gfk.com slash behavior change and our reports are out now. Uh, afterwards, uh, you'll receive a link where you can uh, download this recording and also the slides. So many thanks for joining and have a lovely day.